Hello, and a very, very good evening to you. Even if it's morning or afternoon, I wish you a very, very good evening out of the magnanimousness and the madness of my soul. Uh, this is going to be a little talk and a reading uh, about the work that Jean de Salzman did uh, from the 1950s to the 19, late 1980s. And it will include a reading from her superb, The Reality of Being. And Jean de Salzman actually was in charge of something called the Gurdjieff Foundation for many, many years, which was established by Lord John Pentland in the late 1940s. And Jean de Salzman went on with the Gurdjieff Foundation directing it and so on. And in the latter stages of her life, her son, Michel de Salzman, actually took over operations. And the evening that Gurdjieff died, he was actually with Jean de Salzman, uh, and they were involved in a, in a movements class. And he just literally collapsed, and he was taken to hospital where he actually died. And after his death, the work was continued, uh, by Jean de Salzman and the Gurdjieff Foundation. And Jean de Salzman lived to be 101, which is a very, very good yardstick for all of us. It's a very, very long uh, life indeed, in which, as I say, she did a, a tremendous amount of work. And Gurdjieff himself said, I said this in another talk, that he wished for a nucleus to be formed uh, of people who are capable of responding to the ideas and therefore carrying them forward, uh, which is what Jean de Salzman and Michel de Salzman and the people who came after them actually actually did and are still, still doing to this very, very day. The nucleus that Gurdjieff spoke of was actually formed uh, and the work is being continued and it's very, very, very beautiful. Uh, before I read from the reality of being and give a, the, the reality of being uh, and give a little bit of a commentary on it, I'd like to read something from the notes of Jean de Salzman, and it's an essential aspect of the work, the work that we do upon ourselves, and and she refers to it as the actual as actually the aim of the work. This is the whole aim of the work, and I will I will share it with you now. And the quote from, her, from Jean de Salzman's notebook goes as follows. There are three forces of the body, the mind and the feeling. Unless these are together, equally developed and harmonised, a steady connection cannot be made with a higher force. Everything in the work is preparation for that connection. That is the aim of the work. The higher energy wishes to, but cannot come down to the level of the body unless one works on harmonising these three forces, i.e. the body, the mind and the feeling. Only by working can you fulfil your purpose and participate in the life of the cosmos. That is what can give you significance and meaning to your life. Otherwise, you exist only for yourself, egotistically, and then there is no meaning in your life. End of quote. And it's, it's, an, it's an astonishing quote, because as we know, people who are in the work, the, the three major centres, the, the body, the mind, and, and the, the, the feeling, the emotion, need to be harmonised. Uh, and integrated to form a whole. And once this occurs, the higher energy can actually penetrate us. But we need to get rid of so much that has been stuck onto us via false personality, all the things we've learned when we were growing up and ideas of, of right and wrong and of, of certain concepts that we may have about life. They all need to go and we need to work upon ourselves to bring the three major parts together and actually connect to the higher energy. And it's funny, there is, a, there is a line in scripture, I believe it's in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, which is frequently very, very misunderstood. And it is, 
when more than two are gathered in my name, there I am amongst you. And it's, it's referring to the three centres being gathered together and the great I am, uh, the I am of Moses, I am that I am, uh, the real I. Fascinating journey. <clears throat> the section that I would like to read for you from the reality of being is from chapter 7 and it's entitled, Who Am I? And we are asked to ask ourselves that question on a very, very regular basis and let it resound in our whole being. Who am I? Who am I? And in, in the, the, the passage that I'm going to read, Jean de Salzman speaks about not knowing from where we came and not knowing where we are going. So therefore, who am I? And the quote I've just read about bringing the three centres together is very, very important because it gives us a place in the universe in which we work upon ourselves for the benefit of those around us whom we are working with and for the benefit of the universe itself. Let me find the section from the reality of being, please. Shouldn't take too long. I hope you're having a really, really lovely evening, even if it's morning or afternoon. There was a, a famous diarist in London where this broadcast is coming from, in London town, uh, and his name was Samuel Pepys, P-E-P-Y-S, and he wrote lots and lots of diaries and loads and loads of volumes, and one of the mo most famous quotes in those diaries is the following. All days and evenings are very, very beautiful, but some are more beautiful than others. That was Samuel Pepys from his diaries, Pepys. Chapter 7, Who Am I? from the reality of being. And there's a few maxims before the chapter begins. And they are, I always believe that I exist and that my imagination of myself, what we call personality, does not. This ferocious egotism is me and I have to become conscious of its action. What I must explore is not beyond the self, but the very basis from which I think and feel. I do not know who I am. I do not know whence I came, and I do not know where I will go. The wish to be conscious is the wish to be. It can only be understood in silence. The self belongs to the absolute. I cannot exist outside the absolute, outside the self of the absolute. The true self is like space, unattached, pure and infinite. My true nature is consciousness. To know the self is to be the self. Ego and Illusion, Chapter 72 the imagination of myself. In order to know who I am, I need to see what is real in me. The biggest obstacle is illusion. I accept imagination in the place of consciousness, an idea of myself instead of a feeling of I. In coming to work together, each of us brings something very important, his ego. I try to understand why I came. I see that it is my ego, my person, who is here, to which I cling. And I see, if I am, if I am sincere, that it is mixed up in large measure with, which, with what led me here. But it will not be able to help me. To see this, and to see that I still believe myself to be this person, makes me put the question makes me put the question with more feeling then who am i we are all such as we are under the influence of our imagination of ourselves this influence is all powerful and conditions every aspect of our lives on the one hand 
there is this imagination, this false notion of myself. On the other hand, there is a real I. That I do not know. I do not see the difference. It is as though this I were buried under a mass of beliefs, interests, tastes and pretensions. Everything I affirm is the imagination of myself. What I cannot affirm, because I do not know it, is the real I. Let me repeat that because it's absolutely astonishing. <sighs> Everything I affirm is imagination of myself. What I cannot affirm, because I do not know it, is the real I. It calls to be known and has a nostalgia for knowing, longing to be active, to know. But today it is weak. Nevertheless, it is like a seed. And if my interest is sufficient, the search for this knowing can be the ground in which my eye can grow. I, I, I need to learn to recognise and to separate the real I from the imagination of myself. This is an arduous task because my imagined I defends itself. It is opposed to the real I and, ex and is exactly what I am not. In thinking of myself, I always believe that I exist and that my, and that my imagination of myself, what we call personality, does not. I have no idea of this imagination. So long as I do not know it, I cannot know what I am. This imagination of I, me, lies at the heart of my usual sense of self, the ego, and all the movements of my and all the movements of my inner life go to protect it. And this tendency exists as much in the unconscious as in the conscious layers of myself. It is, because we it is because we want at all costs to protect this imagination that our experience and our knowledge have such importance for us. The things that we do are not chosen because we like to do them, but because we thereby affirm and assure our imagined I. There is no thought or feeling that is not motivated by this. It is, however, so subtle that we do not see it. We are so preoccupied with what we would ideally like to be that we do not see what we actually are now, right now in this present moment. Perhaps behind the formation of this idea of I, there is the echo of a very deep wish the wish to be, the wish to be entirely what I am. But today, the controlling influence is the idea of myself. And this imagined I desires, fights, compares and judges all the time. It wants to be first. It wants to be recognised, admired and respected and makes its force and power felt. This complex Entity has been formed over centuries by the psychological structure of society. Do I know this? Not just in passing or in having noticed it one day or another, but do I really see it at the moment in each action? When I work, when I eat, when I speak with another person? Can I be aware of my wish to be someone? and my way of always comparing myself to another. If I see it, I can experience the wish to liberate myself from it, and also see why I wish to liberate myself. So long as I have not understood that this is the essence of my search, that here is the first step toward knowledge of myself, I will continue to be fooled, and all my efforts, all the ways I try to change, will lead only to disappointment. The imagined I, my imagination of I, will continue to be reinforced.
even in the most unconscious layers of myself. I must honestly accept that I really do not know this. Only in accepting this as a fact, as a fact will I become interested and truly wish to know it. Then my thoughts, my feelings and my actions will be no longer objects for, for me to look at with indifference. They are me, expressions of myself, which I alone am here to understand, if I wish to understand them. I must live with them, not as a spectator, but with affection and without judging and excusing them. It is necessary to live with my thoughts, my feelings and my actions, to suffer them moment to moment. Section 73. Ferocious Egotism. We are not what we believe ourselves to be. Blinded by our imagination, we overestimate ourselves and lie to ourselves. We always lie to ourselves, at every moment, all day, all our lives. If we could stop inwardly and observe without preconception, accepting for a time this idea of lying, then perhaps we would see that we are not what we think we are. I can have moments of real tranquility, of silence, in which I open to another dimension, another world. I'm going to stop there for a moment, because over the last week or so I've been sitting in silence and doing nothing. Just total and absolute silence, sitting at the table, sitting at the sofa, wherever, outside. And it is in that silence, that absolute silence, that one goes very, very deep within oneself and discovers something which is sort of covered over by our everyday desire to be part of society and this imagination of ourselves. And the silence is so, so deeply, profoundly rewarding and, and uplifting. And it just makes one, just to be able to do it is so extraordinary. And many, many years ago, I will tell you a little story now. It's about 20, about 20 years ago, I lived in central London in an apartment with a girl I was, a girl I was with at the time. And it was, it was just awful. And we separated. And I was looking through real estate agents, uh, magazines and papers and things. And an ad, it hit me right between the eyes directly. Uh, and I phoned the number. And the guy who answered at the other side, I knew him. As soon as he answered the phone, I knew the person. And he told me his name was Peter Morehouse. And he lived in a place called the Dudden Valley, D-U-D-D-O-N, uh, in the Lake District in the United Kingdom. And where he lived was one of the most isolated, isolated places, is one of the most isolated places in the United Kingdom. And after phoning him, I went to see him with a few of my belongings. And when the train, I went on the train from London to the, London to the Lake District. And when the train rolled into the station, there was about 50 people on the platform. And I saw him immediately. I knew him, this Peter Morehouse. And we got in his car and we drove for about two hours to the remote house. And I'd been there about a day. The fourth way wasn't mentioned. And I'd, 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 I'd rented a, a section of the house. And I came down one morning and he's sitting reading The Fourth Way by Uspensky. And I was freaking totally and utterly blown away. In the, one of the most remote parts of the, of the world, and the man whose number I had phoned to rent accommodation from was sitting reading The Fourth Way. And he very, very rarely spoke. And we would sit and we would have dinner, which would last for about five hours. And there was total and absolute si silence. And in that silence came something which convinced me that we are not what we believe ourselves to be amidst the noise and the clamour. It was a very, very astonishingly beautiful experience. I will continue with the 
That was a little divertissement. I will continue with the reading of The Reality of Being. Uh, section 73, Ferocious Egotism. I can have moments of real tranquility, of silence, in which I open to another dimension, another world. And that's what this work is about, about opening to another dimension, another world. What I do not see, that is apart, that is apart from these moments, I am prey to conflict and contradiction, that is, to the violence of my egotistical action, which never ceases to isolate and divide me. Everything I do arises from this action. As I discover new possibilities, I need to know what is at the root of this other part of my nature. I have to see that it is not something foreign that I can put aside when and as I, when and as I wish, it is what I am, and it cannot be otherwise. This ferocious egotism is me, and I have to become conscious of its action. To see this violence, I have to enter into an intimate and real contact with myself, to observe myself without any image. Why do we have a compelling need to prove ourselves? to actualize ourselves. A profound impulse is at play, the deep, the deep fear of being nothing. The fear of total isolation, of emptiness, of solitude. We have created this solitude with our minds, with self-protecting and egocentric thoughts like me and mine, my name, my family, my position, my qualities. Deep down, we feel empty and alone, living lives that are narrow and superficial, emo emotionally starved and intellectually repetitious. Because our petty eye is a source of suffering, we wish, consciously or unconsciously, to lose ourselves in individual, or collective stimulation, or in some form of sensation. Every single thing in our lives, entertainment, games, books, food, drink, sex, encourages stimulation on different levels. We revel in this, and we seek to find a state of happiness, to maintain a pleasure in which we can forget the I. All the time, our minds are, our minds are busy in evasion, constantly seeking in one way or another to be entirely absorbed in something outside ourselves, to be captivated by some belief, love, or work. The evasion has become more important than the truth we cannot face. Revolving around my self-interest, our narrow mind diminishes the challenges of life by interpreting them with its limited understanding. As a result, our lives suffer from a lack of intense, strong feeling, a lack of passion. It is an essential problem. When we have real passion in the depths of ourselves, we feel strongly and are extremely sensitive to life, to suffering, to beauty, to nature, to everything. We care about life, its possibilities, in work together and in relation. But without passion, life is empty and meaningless. If we do not feel deeply the beauty of life and its challenge, that then life has no sense at all. We function mechanically, Yet this passion is not devotion or sentimentality. As soon as a passion has a motive or a preference, it becomes pleasure or pain. The passion we need is the passion to be. The next section, I'm coming away from the script. Uh, the next section is very, very harsh. Uh, it's about love and it's about love and the fact that very, very few people actually are capable of, of loving. 
uh, but it's very, very true. Uh, I go back to the script now. Centred in our ordinary eye, most of us do not love and are not loved in return. We have very little love in our hearts, which, which is why we beg for it and seek it in substitutes. Our usual emotional state is negative. All our feelings are reactions. In fact, we do not know what it would be to have a positive feeling, what it would be to love. My ordinary eye, my ego, is always preoccupied with what pleases or what, dis what, pleases or what displeases me, what I like or what I dislike. It always wants to receive to be loved and, in, and impels me to seek love. I give in order to receive. Perhaps this is generosity of, of the mind, my eye, but it is not generosity of the heart. I love with my eye, my ego, but not with my heart. Deep down, this eye is always in, is always in conflict with the other person and refuses to share. Now, now the next line is like a sledgehammer blow on the head, uh, and it's one of the truest things that I've actually ever read. Uh, back to the script. To, to live without love is to live in perpetual contradiction, a refusal of the real, and what a refusal of the real and what is. Without love, one can never find what is true and all human relationships are painful. If I do not know myself totally, my mind and my heart, my pain and my avidity, I cannot live in the present. What I must explore is not beyond the self, but the very basis from which I think and feel. My thought craves continuity, permanence, and its wish gives rise to and its wish gives rise to my ordinary I. This thinking is the source of fear, fear of loss, of suffering. If I do not know my total consciousness, unconscious as well as conscious, I will not understand fear, and my entire search will go array, will go astray and be deformed. There will be no love, and my only interest will be ensuing the continuity of this I, even after death. There will be no love, and my only interest will be ensuing the continuity of this I, even after death. I'm coming off the script now. That reminds me of lots of classical philosophy of being chained, being chained to a wheel of eternal repetition from which one can, cannot escape. It sounds utterly horrifying. Section seven, section, I beg your pardon, section 74, free of fear and illusion. Is it possible to have a mind with a quality that is always fresh, always new, with a thinking that creates no habits and clings to no belief. For this, we must understand the total consciousness with which we live. It functions within a limited frame that must be broken in order for it to be free. What we seek, what we seek is the state of mind that says, I don't know. Instead of trying to know what is unconscious, we have to see the false as false. It is the negation of the false that empties the mind of the known. Only a mind that is empty can come to a state of not knowing and discover what is true. What is important to see is that words and ideas enslave us in formulas and concepts. As long as we are trapped in a net of consoling belief, we lack the intensity and subtlety required for real exploration. Unless I understand this, my observation will remain based on forms of what I know of what I know 
and will not be enlivened by the spirit of discovery as if for the first time, and it will be egocentric. My ordinary eye interpreting everything that is presented from its self-centered perspective. We have to understand, we have to understand fear in our lives, lives, a fundamental fact. Indeed, so long as our total consciousness has not been liberated from fear, we will not be able to go very far, to penetrate deeply in ourselves. By its very nature, fear is inevitably opposed to our entire search. But what is the basis for fear in us? Does fear as such really exist? Have we ever experienced it as, have we ever experienced it as a reality in itself? and not simply the feeling that precedes or follows an event. When we are truly face to face with the event, for example, danger, are we afraid? In fact, fear only arises at the moment that thinking fixes on the, on the past or the future. If our attention is, is in the active present, to think of yesterday or of tomorrow is simply inattention, an inattention that engenders fear. When we give our total attention to the present, when we are wholly present, fear does not exist. We see that we do not know, that we cannot respond. In this state of complete uncertainty, we can discover that which is true, true. If we wish to penetrate, if we wish to penetrate deeply in ourselves and see what is here and even beyond, we must have no fear of any kind, not of failure, not of suffering, and above all, not fear of death. We have never, with our whole being, inquired what death is. It is always considered in terms of survival as life, as life continuing like a chain or an endless movement. But this survival is only the survival of what is known. In fact, our lives are a continuity of the known. We act from the known to the known. We wish for continuity and cling to survival without ever questioning the origin of this wish. We do not see that it, is, that it is merely a hollow projection of the thought, that it comes from the imagined I, created by our identifications. My family, my home, my, my work achievements. When we realise this clearly, we can approach the question of continuity without sentimentality and without our usual ambition to affirm ourselves. We need to see that there is no thinker, that this imagined I which thinks me and mine is simply an illusion. In order for us to receive truth, this must be dispelled, as well as all the other illusions of the thinking, including those behind our desire for pleasure or satisfaction. Only then can we see the real nature of our ambitions, struggles and sufferings. Only then can we see through them and come to a state, a state free of contradiction, a state of, a state of emptiness in which we experience love. What is important is to, is to live with this void in which the self is abandoned. I'm going to have to repeat that line again. What is important is to live in the void in which the self is abandoned. With this abandonment arises the, arises the passion to be, a wish which is beyond thought and feeling, a flame which, a flame which destroys all that is false. This energy allows the mind to penetrate the unknown. No movement, no movement 
from the periphery towards the centre will ever reach the centre. A surface movement trying to become deeper will never be more than of the, than of the surface. In order to understand itself, the mind has to be completely still, without illusion. Then, with lucidity, we can see the insignificance of me, dissolve in an immensity beyond all measure. There is no time, only the present moment. Yet to live in the present is wholly sufficient unto itself. At each moment one dies. At each moment one dies. One lives. One loves. One is. Free of fear and illusion, moment after moment, we die, we die to the known in order to enter the unknown. End of section from The Reality of Being. And in my, my, my 30 years, plus 30 years of involvement, uh, that is one of the, if not the most astonishing uh, work passages and descriptions that I've ever come across. Because fundamentally, when we are saying me and the word I, uh, it's actually adding weight to the illusion that is engendered uh, by our false personalities and the imagination of ourselves. And all this needs to go slowly but surely. It needs to be etched away and sort of to bring us to a state where, as Jean de Saltzman has just said, uh, the passion we require is the passion to be. To be or not to be. That is the question above all other questions. And, and being, being aware of it and being able to answer the question, who am I, is the most beautiful thing in the world. I am eternal consciousness. My consciousness, my consciousness at the moment is in a body which was given the name of Noel, as with all of us. But that conscious is eternal. And all the things that in this present incarnation that, is, that it is affected by externally is an illusion. One is actually in a world of fantasy until one actually comes into contact with one's essence, with one's self. I've just written something down, some notes to the talk I've just given, which I'd like to share with you in conclusion. Uh, the absolute essence of the work is contained within, within the reading that I've just given. And most importantly, if it is put into practice, we die to the known in, and we enter into the unknown. A stripping away, a stripping away of the illusion of me and mine and of all one <laughs> believes one knows. It is the moment of emptiness and silence. It is in a moment of emptiness and silence that we are able to love and we are able to be. This will never occur within the thinking mind. And it won't. I find with the reality of being, like most of the fourth way literature, that it needs to be absorbed fully. And this means repeated readings, so it actually goes in. We don't want to talk about it, we want to feel it. We want to connect to our being by realising the truth of what Madame de Salzman actually says in this stupendous work. And I, I was looking, I will go on camera soon, on the next couple of days, and give a, a, a talk about the wartime meetings that Gurdjieff gave from 1941 to 1945 in his Parisian apartment. And I was looking at one the other evening, 
and he was talking about reading and he said to one woman she'd read lots and lots of books but she didn't remember anything and obvi obviously none of it was absorbed and he said to her you're not reading you don't read uh, you're reading it like you you read a newspaper or a magazine or a, a trashy a trashy novel or whatever you need to read he said take take half a page and and absorb it fully what you're reading and take it eat it and take it into your being and i spoke and this is very very true we don't generally we are not generally fully attentive to what we read uh, because we've never become used to doing this. And I'm, I'm actually working with someone at the moment, a gentleman who's been involved for a couple of months, and he's making great progress. It's really a, a joy to behold. And he's, he's working lots and lots of hours per day. And he said, I want to have loads and loads of time to read the fourth way literature and to, to study it and to learn it and so on. And I said, this is totally irrelevant. What you need to do is you need, he said, I've only got 30 minutes a day to look at it due to my, my work situation. I said, That's, that couldn't be better. Uh, cut it in half, cut it down to 15, 15 minutes and, and concentrate fully on a passage. If you take a passage from the fourth way, from the reality of being, from In Search of the Miraculous, and fully absorb half a page and take it into your bloodstream so that you will never, ever forget it and then apply it to your life, and this is how it works. We don't skim read, skim read fourth way books. We actually go very, very deep into them if we wish to gain anything from them. But this, this extract I've just shared with you from the reality of being is absolutely astonishing. A very, very beautiful woman was Jean de Salzman, uh, and the work that she did was, was just literally beyond belief. As I say, when I began this talk, she lived to be 101 and she was as, as, as fit as one could be until the last few weeks. Uh, a truly extraordinary person. Um, silence. It's a truly extraordinary thing and it's full of so much potential and it's absolutely of a different, a different dimension. Just to be silent, to be still. Any questions or whatevers, you send me an email, it's in the description box. Uh, and the very, very final words of Hamlet in that glorious play by Shakespeare, the rest is silence. Thank you very much for listening and lots and lots of conscious love to you. This is Noel Troy from the, the Hermes Noel and the Fourth Way Chanel number five or otherwise. I like Chanel number five on female friends. It's just very, very extraordinary, beautiful smell.